Young imam, and who is that person? We're talking about that man. Late 1700s, early 1800s, 1801, 1802, but late 1700s, his name was Bilali Muhammad. Bilali, first known imam in America, Bilali Muhammad, according to what the scholars are saying, those who wrote books about this time period. And we're talking about the first half of the Quran in America, the first half of the Quran was a man named Ayub ibn Suleiman, known as Job bin Solomon as well. We talked about this Friday night. But we stopped in the 20s. We was talking about this man, Edward Blyton. Let's, let's go back to him, then we'll come forward. We said Edward Blyton was born in 1832, born to enslaved parents here in, in America, well, actually in the Caribbean. And he was a very gifted little boy, and he taught us Spanish, and he was adopted by this American Colonization Society. And he <clears throat> was trained as a, as a, what, a Presbyterian minister, a, uh, not Baptist, Pres my father was a Baptist minister. <laughs> a Presbyterian minister. He was sent back to start Liberia in West Africa. He went over there, according to his book, to Christianize the heathens. And he got over there, he ran to, unbeknown to him, there were other, Mus other people there, other religions there. Unbeknown to him, he gets over there and there's another religion, Islam. And he becomes so enthralled with the Muslims over there, he didn't expect that. He learns Arabic. He spent several years over there learning Arabic. He goes there when he's 18 years old, 1850. So he learns Arabic, and he becomes, he started, helps start the first college in Liberia. He becomes the Secretary of State of Liberia. He writes a book, famous book. It was published in 1887, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race. A comparative religion book. And what he does in this book, he writes about what he saw transpire in West Africa. He had no reason to, to lie or to be inaccurate because he went over there as a Christian to make every to convert people to Christianity. He runs into this other religion. And people in America didn't tell us another religion other than Christianity, everybody else was heathen. He goes to there, there's Muslims over there enthralled by them. So in his book, he writes about the Muslims he saw there, how peaceful Islam spread in Western Africa, how unifying it was, how fulfilling it was, how it feeds the intellect. He talks about how demoralizing Christianity was, degrading Christianity, according to him. It was. You know? He saw the remnants of the Great West African Muslim Empire, the Ghana, the Mali, the Sangha empires in West Africa. He saw the remnants of those empires in West Africa. You know, those empires are very, very wealthy, very, very knowledgeable, had great centers of learning. We talk about Timbuktu, the well known, famous place, Timbuktu, the magnificent Timbuktu. And the Segura University had a Timbuktu. This university and it had all these books, libraries there were in Timbuktu, it had schools there, the Segura University there. And I'll tell you how my friends in Yaks, Mississippi, they run a museum called the International Museum of African Culture. If you ever get a chance, you go there. They have a $2 million exhibit from Mali. They partner with the state of Mali in the state of Mississippi, they brought this exhibit to Jackson, Mississippi. And at one time, it was a traveling exhibit. Anyway, it's an excellent exhibit. And they, they, were all, they brought all these manuscripts. These manuscripts go back to the, the 1100s from West Africa, written in Arabic. Qurans, uh, tafsir books, uh, medicine, Mathematics, algebra. In fact, one of the books 
that we discovered as part of Sango University, they looked at this book and compared it to uh, algebra here in this country. It was college level algebra. They had books on medicine, all this stuff. They had so many libraries there. This was known, the area was called the Gold Coast. Ghana, in the Arabic, El Ghani means wealth, wealthy. Allah is El Ghani, independent one. Wealth, full of wealth, independent. So that area was Ghana. It's almost the same word. Another country in that area was Guinea. Almost the same word. Then they, that area was called one time Gold Coast. The Gold Coast. They had that much wealth. One of the brothers here Friday night, I don't see him. He brought up a very good point. Mansa Musa. You hear the man of Mansa Musa? Mm. Oh, you hear the man of Mansa Musa. Young man right there. Good. Mansa Musa, a legendary pilgrimage in the, in the 13th century from Mali going to Africa. 300 plus camels loaded with gold. That they were so wealthy, loaded with gold. And every town and village he went through going on Hajj, he changed the economy because he had that much wealth. There's an ancient map done in West Africa that has Mesa Musa holding a huge nugget of gold. You know? So those people just that wealthy. And their education was, institution was that, that well known. You know? And people came from all over Africa to go to school there. Mongo Park, we talked about Mongo Park the other night. He said at one time, St. Gore University had 25,000 students there. So he brought his arm back over. He was the linchpin, Edward Black, key figure. Reintroduced Islam to America. Secretary of State came here eight times up and down the East Coast talking about Islam, extolling the virtues of this ex Presbyterian minister, extolling the virtues of Islam. That sparked interest in Islam and engendered the, the movements that we have today. You know, we talked about Noble Drew Ali the other night, Morris Science Temple, we talked about him, we talked about Marcus Garvey and Duse Muhammad, his mentor and partner, Duse Muhammad. We talked about them the other night. We talked about the Ahmadiyyas and the role they played in the black community in urban cities. We talked about them the other night. We talked about Sheikh Daoud Fazil and Mother Khadija the other night. Wali Akram, had Haji Wali Akram the other night. We talked about all the other night. We had gotten to the nation is long. That's where we stopped at. The nation is long. Of all these different groups that sprung up during the 1920s, in the early 1930s, the most influential of these groups, these Muslim movements, was the Nation of Islam. You had Sunni groups too. The Nation of Islam was a Sunni Islamic group, like Noble Drew Ali in the Mars Science Temple. But you had Sun Daoud Fazal, Mother Khadija, Professor uh, Iz uh, Izzedine, these were Sunni groups. Wali Akram left Ahmadiyya and went to Sunni Islam. But the most influential group was the Nation of Islam. Very interesting story. Very interesting story. Started in roughly 1930. There was a man named, who had several names, Farad Muhammad, W.L. Farad, W.D. Farad. This mysterious man appeared in Detroit, selling, of all things, selling silk in the ghetto. And just think about that. <laughs> just let that sink in. He was in a, a very impoverished area selling, selling silk door to door in the ghetto in 1830. He had several names. Okay. W.D. Farad, Farad Muhammad, Farad Muhammad. He used several names. Very mysterious man. No one really knows where he came from, although he claimed he was from Mecca. He said he was Muslim from Mecca, from Arabia. He, he made that claim, but he was from Arabia. Now, a, a, a gentleman named Carl Evans did a, some, uh, 
He did a report on him, an investigation on him. He said, Carl Evans said that he thinks that he was from Pakistan because of the words and name that he used, right? So he was selling pil uh, silk door to door just to get a chance to talk to people. He found a few people to listen. One household and two households. And he started to have meetings, bringing these people together to have meetings. And he would tell these people some mysterious stuff. They're part of the lost tribe of the nation is long. The name he gave them, the lost tribe of the nation is long. These people had never heard this before. Christianity is a white man's religion. See? Black man's religion is long. You're the tribe of Shabazz. Shabazz is a word that comes from uh, Pakistan. You're the tribe of Shabazz. The black man is God Almighty. Stop for a long. You said what? They got your attention. That the black, black man was God. Stop for a long. We get to that in a minute. And the white man, the one who had dehumanized you, he was the blue eyed devil. He told him this. Yeah. And it resonated with black people. Now, see, you can't really judge Farad Muhammad and Elijah Muhammad in 2022 context. You have to go back in that context, a different context then, different environment, different context, yeah. in order to understand this. You, you look at that today and say, wait, black man of God, <laughs> what is he talking about? The white man's the devil. People believe that? Yes, they did. Even beyond the 1920s, they did. I got into this nation of Islam in the 1970s. I had gone to college. And guess what? But it resonated with people because you had to understand the context of things then, you see. You had to understand that context. There had been crimes against humanity here in, in the Western world. Crimes against humanity. You look at what happened in the Western world. You know, some people have the, I read somewhere, I think it was uh, Joy DeGruy, Dr. Joy DeGruy, she defined trauma as trauma being an outside force, violent force or experience or event that injures you physically, spiritually, Emotionally or mentally, that's trauma. Okay? And she says that what took place over here for three to four years was trauma. The, the people here have been traumatized. PTSD. PTSD is real. Nowadays, people see one violent e event, they have PTSD. One violent event. People saw George Floyd murder and they have PTSD. There was a juror said when she had to see that over and over again in the courtroom with George Floyd, she developed PTSD. She had to get therapy. You see? When you see something like that, it could traumatize you. These people brought over here for three, four hundred years experiencing murder, death. Now imagine, you have a son. He's 12 years old, or he's 10 years old. You're the father. Someone takes your son from you and sells him to another man somewhere else, somewhere else out of state. These people, these Africans went through this. You have your son, you love your son. They take him to get your son and they sell your son somewhere. You never see your son again. Or your daughter, they take your daughter and sell your daughter somewhere. You never see your daughter. Can you imagine how traumatizing that was? Or they take your little daughter, 12 years old, and abuse her. It was raped. A lot of these children was raped. Or they raped your wife. Yeah, they did all these things. If you did anything to try to stop them, they'll mutilate you. We talked talk about culture the other night. They cut your foot off, they cut your finger off, cut your ear off. 
beat you relentlessly or kill you, three, four hundred years of this, that's pure PTSD. That is trauma that has become transgenerational. Okay? That's been traumatized. Okay? And what that trauma has done, that trauma has scarred the psyche of people, injured people spiritually, emotionally, psycho psychologically, caused mental abuse, social abuse, personal abuse that has become transgenerational. Solely because of hate, because they hated you that much. Whites hated blacks that just that much. They caused that much trauma, that much harm was done. And let me give you an example I'm talking about. Then we're going to get back to nations around. But I want you to sort of feel what it was like <coughs> then, you know, why in the context it existed again. It was easy for, the, for people to believe that the white man was the devil. And the black man was God. Look, you ever heard of, has anyone ever heard of Alta Bingo? Alta Bingo. Let me tell you about Alta Bingo. There was, did you know that here in America and in all the major cities in Europe, they had human zoos? You ever heard that before? Human zoos. Human zoos. Yeah, they, they did that and they took them to Europe and put the little kids in cages all over. Yeah. Thank you. That is not told too often. It's not, you can't find that in pages of textbooks. We said at night there's missing pages when it comes to history. Not many people know that. That they had human zoos. Most of the people in the zoo were black people, but they had Indigenous Americans, we call them American natives, Indians. Indigenous American in human zoos, some there, some Aborigines from the Philippines in human zoos. But most of them were black, African American, in human zoos. It would help them with the animals. The most well known man in the human zoo was this man at Alta Bingo. I'm trying to give you an example of how people are traumatized, what trauma does. You see? And all this trauma because of hate. Hate the whites had been for blacks. Alta Bingo was a, was a black man put in a, along with many other blacks, in a zoo with apes. It's hard to imagine that human beings would do this to each other. What do you think it was? What was this zoo in America? This is one of the most famous zoos in America. Where was it at? What do you think of that? Now I'm from Mississippi, right? You know Mississippi has a very horrific history when it comes to race. Thank you. Thank you. Where? Where in New York? You're right. <laughs> You're right. It was in Bronx, New York. <laughs> of all places. You heard about this. Evidently. Bronx, New York. He was in a human zoo with apes in Bronx, New York, and it would trap white people all over. They come and see this black man in this human zoo. In Europe, they had him in all the major cities, in Germany and France, all these major cities had human zoos, had people in these human zoos. We're not talking about 1700, 1800. The last human zoo closed in 1956. I was born in 52, closed in 1956. So the most famous, well-known man, I shouldn't use the word famous, that was in the human zoo is this man, Alter Bingo. And they finally released him after being in a human zoo, being in a zoo with apes for many, 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 many years. They released him. He was traumatized. Guess what he did? Guess what he did? He went and bought a gun. What did he do with that gun? 
He went and got a gun. And what did he do with that gun? You would think that he would hunt down those people who put him in the zoo or kill white people. Oh, he put the gun to his head. And he killed himself. Because when people are traumatized or abused, a lot of times they blame themselves. When a female is abused, why can't she, she blame herself? If I had not done this, or maybe I shouldn't have gone there, maybe I was wearing the wrong clothes, it's her fault. People who are abused generally blame themselves. He disliked himself so much that he killed himself. Not once. That's what trauma does. So when I see things that African Americans are doing nowadays, I sort of understand it. Because this stuff can become transgenerational, social patterns that's passed from one generation to the next generation. Give you an example. We're still talking about why it was easy to see white people as, as the devil, yeah. as the nation we love to talk. Stop the law. Of course, we don't believe that now. In 1949, there was this dog test. Dr. Clark did a test called a dog test. He had a black dog and a white dog. He had three black children, ages three and four. He asked his little children, choose a dog that's pretty, the dog that's smart. Choose a dog that you like. Choose a dog that's nice. Yeah. Each time these little black girls to choose the white dog. Everything positive in it chose the white dog. Then he asked them, Dr. Clark asked these children, choose a dog that's ugly, a dog that's dumb, a dog that's bad, a dog you don't like. Each time they chose a dog that looked just like them. Man, that's what white supremacy does. Why supremacy is a, her a racial hierarchy what, they, you know, that weaponizes institutions, ideals, concepts to promote white people there on top. Uh, and affects people. It scars their psyche. Okay. These children's psyche have been scarred. We said trauma affects you emotionally, psychologically. Yeah. Dr. Sherman Jackson said this is all the world though, not just black people. More intense with black people because of the trauma we had in America. I was in uh, Abu Dhabi at L.A. at a school over there. I remember walking off campus two or three blocks down the street, went to a store over there. And look, small convenience store, smaller than a 7 Eleven. And I was totally dismayed. Walk in the store, and it had shells of skin bleaching cream. I can't imagine going to 7 Eleven seeing shells of skin bleaching cream. You know what I mean? Skin bleaching cream? Mm -hmm. no. I went into a, they have these big stores like a Walmart. They're called Carfuls. Uh, you been to UAE? Yeah. Carfuls. Big Thanks. box, big box store. And shells of skin bleaching cream. You don't see that over here. That's very popular over there. Evidently, it's in demand over there. These are Arabs. Bleaching his skin. We had a guide over there. He worked, he worked for this seminary. He would take us different places. Everywhere this guy went, he would talk to us. His desire was, he said it's one of these young men here. His desire was to have a blood. 
He used to talk about this repeatedly. He was an Arab. He didn't want an Arab blind. I want a blind, I want a blind, I want a blind, I want a blind, I want a blind. You see this white supremacy thing? This racial hierarchy around the world. I remember getting, um, years ago, I used to get the Islamic Horizon magazine. These are the ads in the back, matrimony ads in the back. People who are looking to get married. And they would say, they want someone fair skinned. You see this white supremacy? I remember going to a, a Muslim convention in 2016. I'm not going to mention which one it was. We was at this session with these well-known Muslims that we know in America talking, talking about racial injustices and stuff like that. And they was quoting Dr. King and Malcolm X. And there was a lady in the audience there. She appeared to be Pakistanian to me. She became very irate, hysterical, to the point she started screaming. How dare you talk about Dr. King, quote Dr. King, Malcolm X. I just left a session, a matrimony session. We had to do a questionnaire there. We had to, ch we had to choose the skin color <coughs> of the person, of a potential mate. She was so irate. He said, we're Muslims. We're talking about Dr. King and what Malcolm X did. And there was a session down here talking about skin color. Do you see what I mean by white supremacy? said? Let's read Dr. Sherman Jackson say it's like a false god in the world today. So get back to the nation of Islam. What Farad Muhammad and Elijah Muhammad trying to do was to address that. You see, that psychological scarring that had taken place in black people who had been traumatized for three to four hundred years. He was trying to address that, trying to destroy that. So he was using these things that he was saying about white people and black people as antidote, as reverse psychology. Now, you're not the bad one. Because they had dehumanized black people. No, they're the black bad people. Not the black people, but the white people. They're the real devil. They're the blue-eyed devil. You're the God. <laughs> and it resonated with black people. Oh, okay. We're God. Stop for law. Stop for law. May Allah forgive us. They're the devil. These people hating you, they're the devil. Cause all this bloodshed and this death and this misery and this trauma who will kill you and kill, rape your women and rape your babies. They're the devil. That's the reason you have African Americans of different shades today. I went to a family reunion a few years ago and I saw some of my relatives there for the first time. They walk here, you think they're Caucasian. Because it, it's that mixture has been in us. Yeah. They're the devil. They claim they don't want to do you. They don't want you to marry their women, blah, blah, blah. But they raped our women repeatedly. Our children, our girls, 12, 13 years old. And our women. We can do anything. Can you imagine how it will traumatize you? They took your family away from you. You never saw them again. They sold them to another man. You cried to God. That's trauma for three to four hundred years. So the psychics of these people have been scarred. So Elijah Muhammad, Farah Muhammad, tried to get this out of them. You see? It was a ploy. So this man appeared in 1930. He found a, a base there in Detroit. His chief supporter was Elijah Poole. He had moved to Detroit in 1925. Farad changed his name to Elijah Kareem, then Elijah Muhammad. A murder took place among his base. This, these black people had murdered someone, a Caucasian person, and they attributed to Farad Muhammad's teaching. So the police was investigating him. He left Detroit with Chicago. They fought him, that investigation fought him in Chicago. 
and he was last seen in 1934 boarding a plane. No one knows where he went. It was in 1934. But he left Elijah Muhammad in charge in Detroit. There was an infight in Detroit, so Elijah Muhammad had to leave Detroit in Chicago. But they had a solid, insular base, you know, well-organized base in Chicago. In 1940, Elijah Muhammad went to prison because he refused to go to the draft. To go to the war, the World War II, so he went to prison. 1945, Malcolm went to prison, 19 years old. Malcolm got out in 1952. Malcolm had an epiphany in prison. Malcolm went to prison as Detroit Red. He had an epiphany with the nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad. He shared himself with Detroit Red, became Malcolm that we know. Studied encyclopedia, literally studied every single word, wrote it down in encyclopedia, in dictionary, encyclopedia, read voraciously several books every month. He said he became so, he became uh, uh, educated in prison, more so in prison than he would have in, because of the distraction, had he gone to a university somewhere. Several books a month, yeah. Joined the debate team in prison. Malcolm came out of prison in 1952, came out in Detroit, Michigan. His brother, stayed with his brother Wilfred X, was his brother in Detroit, Michigan. It was part of the nation of Detroit, Michigan. They had about 400 members there. Very small, insular group. Malcolm out there, Malcolm was upset. It was such a small number of people. Malcolm devised ways to increase the number of people. Malcolm showed them how to go out and recruit people. Yeah. And they would go out, the men would go out and bring and recruit people, go to wherever the people could be found. Nightclubs, uh, corners, pool hall. They would go to these places, they would recruit people to come to the temple. And they would bring 10, 20, 30 people every meeting, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday, to the temple to hear the teaching of Elijah Muhammad. And it started growing somewhere. Detroit people, Muslims in Detroit, all would go to, to Chicago once a month to hear Elijah Muhammad. So they were a very small group, and they knew each other well. Elijah Muhammad knew Malcolm well. So this group began to grow. Yeah. Some people like to think that Malcolm, Malcolm developed on his own. He didn't. Malcolm was produced by Elijah Muhammad. You know, there was a Malcolm didn't appear in a, in a vacuum. Malcolm appeared on a base, a base that already existed. The Nation of Islam, run by uh, Elijah Muhammad, run by Elijah Muhammad, was very well organized. You know, very well organized. They had a, a branch for men, a branch for women, the, the men branch called FOI. Very disciplined, quasi military style group, you know, where the men were very neat, with bow ties. Dressed very clean, um, um, shoes shine all the time, you know. Um, very polite, you know. Yes, sir, no, sir, you know. Uh, trained in uh, martial arts. Uh, had a class where they learned how to drill, had a, a military hierarchy, had lieutenants, had captains, was saluting all the time, standing at attention, you know, drilling all the time. There was an FYI. Then you have a, a, a branch for women called the, the MGT. They went through training as well. Okay. Then you had different lessons. You had a beginner's lesson, you had an intermediate lesson, you had the, the secret lessons. Then you had general facts. Okay. So it was well organized, you see. You had to learn different things. You had to study, you know. You had to really learn. So it was a well organized group. Malcolm, what he did, he took it to another level because his ingenuity and his, act, his, his uh, activism. He found this nation's long small and took it to an entirely different level. Okay. When he came out, 52, there was only 400 members. By the end of the 1950s, there was 100,000 members. He and Elijah Muhammad went to different cities, different arenas in different cities, had a big rallies in different cities. Malcolm had a certain influence. Malcolm was, became the, the minister in, in New York where media capital of the world. New York, and the UN there. He networked with UN ambassadors, the media capital world. He uh, networked with celebrities. 
He had street alliances, going to have rallies in the streets there, you know, had these celebrities that were following him. He went to different universities. He was a skilled debater. You can see a lot of these debates on, on YouTube now. Yale, Harvard, debating some of their top professors. He didn't back down. He won a lot of those debates. Yeah. He was very, very sharp. You see. He had a circle of influence. You see. He took the nation's Islam to an international level. Right, Mama Malcolm went to the Middle East back in 1959, came back and changed the name of the place where the temple, the place where they worshiped called temples at one time. He changed it. They changed the mosque as a result of their trip to the uh, Middle East. So by 1959, this group has really, really grown to 100,000 plus people. You know. The glory days of Nations Law from 1958 to, 58 to 1963, they developed schools, had a, a national, national school system called the University of Islam. They called it schools, elementary schools and high school, University of Islam. Another ploy to address that scarring of the, the psyche that comes from being traumatized. You don't just go to a regular school, you go to a university. This is an elementary school, University of Islam. <laughs> so, and they turned out some good students. They did, they turned out some good students. We had a University of Islam in my hometown, Jackson. It's a nationwide school system, privately run by Muslims. The first so-called Muslim school system. It was nationwide. They later on became Clare Muhammad School. My son went to Clare Muhammad School, college. Yeah. So it became Clare Muhammad School. I taught at Clare Muhammad School. But it became a nationwide effort. You see, all the media attention, nations I'm getting, you know, uh, on, on TV shows, uh, uh, debating people, Mike Wallace did, I hate the hate producers. You heard of that, Hate the Hate Producers, did that special show on television and so forth, you know. Got a lot of media to read a digest called Elijah Muhammad, the most powerful black man in America. All this stuff, Time Magazine writing about Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X, you know. They're going to all these major cities, these rallies. They have schools, they have farmland, they have a bank, they have stores, grocery stores, they have restaurants, they have a, a, a plant that produces the newspaper, whole apartment complexes, houses, the whole nine yard. They are building a nation. And they're talking black men. You're not the black, you're not the Negro. You're the so-called Negro. You're the black man here in America. The black guy. You clean, you wear bow ties, you dress in neat and stuff like that. You, you come to class every Sunday, not Sunday, every Friday. You come to class and you had to get over a scale. You couldn't wait. You had to be he had to eat according to Elijah Muhammad. He produced a book, a book called How to Eat the Leo. Ate one meal a day, bean soup. I lost 40 pounds. <laughs> but really, you asked my wife, I lost 40 pounds. My mother didn't recognize me. <laughs> I went from 200 pounds to 160 pounds. Eating one meal a day. Elijah Muhammad said, you ate like that, you can live forever. At least a thousand years. <laughs> we believed it. <laughs> <laughs> we believed it. We used to eat bean soup. My wife, she next, right, she's in the other room. She cooked bean soup for me and everything. We eat bean soup and whole wheat bread. You as a nation, you ate like, don't get caught potato chips. You can eat potato chips. We had these investigators among us. They were spying on people, make sure you ate right. You eat potato chips. This is a well-disciplined group. That's the point I'm trying to get across. A well-disciplined group. Yeah. And Malcolm had gone to L.A. and he had uh, got with the people out there that had, there's a black newspaper called the L.A. Herald. He learned how to develop a newspaper. He came back to New York, developed the Muhammad Speaks newspaper, and it took off. That newspaper became the most widely sold news, black newspaper in America. <coughs> One of the top newspapers in the whole country. It was selling a million copies a week, not a month. This man is a million copies a week. A week. Knock on every door in the black neighborhood. Telling people about Allah, introducing these in Muslim terms, Islamic terms, Muslim, Allah, 
Quran, Mecca to black people all over the country. You see? Calling it Islam. All over the country. Their version of Islam. All over the country. You see? This newspaper was sold by the FOI, the, the branch for men of the nation of Islam. You come and you came to class that, that, that morning, you had to get your papers. And you better pay. You had to pay up front. <laughs> not credit. Not take the paper and go sell it and bring the, paper, bring the money back. No, you had to pay for these papers up front. You better get them. You had to get at least 300. What you do with those papers up to you. <laughs> you can sell them. You can give them away. You can sell them at profit. You can store them in your trunk or store them in your basement or store them in your house. It doesn't matter. But every day, every week when you're in class, you can get your papers. You better take these papers. These are in the 60s. The papers developed in the early 60s, Mama Speak newspaper. But it was an instrument of doing what we call Darwin nowadays. The instrument of going door to door, introducing these Muslim terms, Islamic terms to people, and getting people houses, and introducing them to Islam. Right? You see? That's what it was. Been, you know, been involved and engaged in the community, having boots on the ground, and not being an insular. So it went from being an insular community under Elijah Muhammad. And the Malcolm became, not insular, became very engaged, community involved community, uh, group. Yeah. Very involved in community. That ruled different cities, inner cities. Nothing happened unless the nation of Islam had approved it in these cities. Yeah. Very involved. Yeah. Most powerful black group in America, the face of Islam was like Muhammad Malcolm X. Then Muhammad Ali became a Muslim. 1963. Yeah. That took it to a different level as well. These men said, don't call me Cassius Clay. <laughs> My name is Muhammad Ali. Cassius Clay is a white man's name. Blah, blah, blah. Can you imagine Chinese be called Larry Smith? Hmm? <laughs> Just imagine that. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? <laughs> We're African. My, 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 uh, my, uh, I said, the African, you know, don't call me. Cassius Clay as a white man, slave master, name, stuff like that, you know. My religion is not Christianity, they were forced on my people. Blah, blah, blah. My religion is law. That was very attractive. They appealed to a lot of black people. So the, the nation of grew. It grew more from 1966-65 than it grew the whole 30 years prior to that. Airplanes. You name banks, the farmland, people galore. Every city and small town had a chapter, had a, a mosque of the nation of Islam. Okay. Mama Lee wouldn't go into the military. You know, they threatened him, took his title. He lost millions of dollars, too. He said, you can stand me up in front of a firing squad tomorrow. I will not renounce my religion. People love that courage. That was attractive to me like people. Yeah. So all this growth took place, this growth. Then Malcolm was assassinated in 1965. But we knew that around life, Muhammad was a lot of spies. Informants. Informants working for the FBI and, and the CIA as well. But he died in 1965. Nation Islam takes a dip. But before Malcolm dies, he goes on, goes to Hodge. He comes to Dallas in 1964, he goes to Hodge. He goes to Hodge, has another uh, uh, epiphany. He says in his book that he left the old Malcolm X over there. He became a Sunni Muslim. He, he changed his whole he, re he denounced racism, white, uh, black superiority, saying the black man was God, all this. He, he, he denounced that. He denounced calling white people derogatory names. He became a Sunni Muslim, praying five times a day. 
But what he did maintain is fight for social justice in America. But he came back over here, he's willing to work with all people, regardless of their skin color, regardless of whether they're Christian or not. See? That's what he did. He worked with Sunni Muslims, not just Nation Islam. He started working with Sunni Muslims. See? He established a mosque. See? And a lot of Sunni Muslim groups developed there. Muslim Islamic Brotherhood, MIB, is in uh, uh, Harlem, New York today. See? Islamic Party of America, Dar Salaam. These groups were Sunni black groups. They evolved around Malcolm. Then other groups evolved around Malcolm too. They were not Muslim. When Malcolm was killed in 1965, he left other groups here. Some of them were not Muslim. The Black Liberation Army, Black Panthers heavily influenced by Malcolm. My group, Republicans of Africa. I just got to remember uh, the Republicans of Africa. They had a violent end in Jackson, Mississippi in 1971. I tell you, the first Muslim I met was a man named uh, Ufago Rashid. He was a Sunni Muslim. Before I got a nation song, when I was 18 years old, when I became a reparation captain. A reparation captain, my job was to, <laughs> reparations when we're, you know, African Americans, you know, our ancestors were emancipated in 1965. First, it promised the, the, the slaves 40 acres and a mule. 40 acres and a mule. 40 acres of land and a mule. And a mule. This is in 1865. You <laughs> see? 40 acres and a mule. Because of the slavery. Right? You emancipate people free, right? They don't have anything. What are they supposed to do? They don't have land. They don't have nothing. Anywhere to stay. No jobs. No money. So to remedy that, they promised him 40 acres of the mule. They never got it. Never got it. So reparation was to get what we was due because of the 400 years of slavery. When the Japanese were interned, because of World War II, they interned Japanese, they got reparations for that. We got nothing. The destruction of World War II in Europe, they paid reparations for that. Black people just let loose. There was nothing. Nowhere to go, no job, no money. Then the black codes kicked in in, the, in 1875, 1880. If you call, if you black, you call Walker. He says loitering. Loitering was a crime for a black person. Not having a job was a crime for a black person. You could be picked up, locked up again, and guess what? Rent it back out to the same, the same slave plantation that you were freed from. Convict lease program. See? We didn't get reparations. We got nothing. We started at the bottom with nothing. No education, no clothes, no nothing. See? So my job was a reparation captain at 18 years old. <laughs> I had a big job. You see? And our president was Amaro Bedelli. Bodyguard and associate friend of Malcolm X. He and his brother. See? All this ended in Jackson in, in August of 1971. I got a few more minutes. In 1971, there was a, we had a headquarters in Jackson. And uh, we had some members who was from out of state. They actually lived there in our headquarters near Jackson State University. 
right behind Jackson State. It'd be two blocks behind Jackson State. I started going in high school, my senior year of high school. I went there almost every day. We did training there, did classes there, and I befriended Ofago Rashid. He was a little bit older than I was. I was 18. He was, he was probably 22, 23. And the others as well. Very close to them. My father was from, I think, New Jersey. So the members that were from out of state actually lived in our house. Our, that was our headquarters. It was just a wood frame small house behind Jackson State. And what happened there, one August, one August, one day in August, 1971, I left there probably around 11, 30, 12 o'clock. I was still living home with my mom. And uh, that night when I left there around 11, 30, that night. A few hours later, they came to the house. Some people said there's 200 of them that came. Police, highway patrol, troopers, and a tank. They blew 10,000 rounds into that house a wood frame house. They came to the kill. They gave everybody 90 seconds to come out. It's two o'clock in the morning. People sleep. You come with your bullhorn, you come with a tank, 200 troopers, you come to kill. I'm willing to believe half of them was part of the KKK to begin with. They had already killed my uncle there. My uncle was shot down the streets of Jackson because he got too close to the white swimming pool. He shot him in the back. But anyway, they gave him 90 seconds to come out of the handgun. They start firing. You'd think they would have killed everybody in, in that wood frame house. No. They did. Nobody in the house was killed. No one in the house was killed. You know why? No, we're no business law. Martial law. Our leader, Amaro Bell, was brilliant. He was a lawyer, too. He and his brother lawyers. And the, the, the young men, all of my friends stayed in the house. These guys were intellectual. They weren't no scum of the street. They were very smart guys. They were going to college and so forth. You know. What they had done under instruction of a moral belly had built a tunnel, a bunker underneath the house. We built a bunker on that house. We was in process of building a tunnel that led from the house to another street. We knew one day they would come for us. That was just the makeup of these people. They loved killing people, especially black people. So they brought all those troopers there with a tank. With a, a tank! Can you imagine that? Instantly, with all the drilling kicked in, they said, come out, your hands up, everybody ran beneath the house. There was a child there, too. i never forget that. Two, three years old. But one of the persons there was a lady. Everybody ran underneath this house. And when the smoke cleared, nobody in the house was hit. Two of the troopers were was hit. Friendly fire? I don't know. 
All our weapons was kept underneath the house. We had holes we could see out of underneath the house. They didn't know we was underneath the house. They fired into the house. Our people were shooting out from underneath the house. So it was a shootout there, and two of them were, were shot. William Skinner died. The police department in Jackson, Mississippi today is named after William Skinner. He died in a shootout. The people in the house, seven of us, a lot of members, my friends, Ofago, Rashid, my dear friends, got life sentences. Parchment, Mississippi. It was like a concentration camp, a pure hellhole. Got life sentences there. There was no possibility of parole. It was found guilty. In Mara over there, like, it was just several of us that didn't live in the house. Again, the ones who lived in the house are the ones who were from out of town. I lived with my mother. Omar Vidalia lived down the street. Chuck Way lived down the street. Several of us lived, didn't live in the house. Uh, of course, they came for me, too. They investigated me and came to me and talked to me many times. Scared me to death, almost. I eventually, they didn't arrest me. I eventually went on to college. Mario Rodella, our leader, didn't get life either. And some of the others who went at the house. Only one who was sentenced to life in prison was the people, the seven that was in that house. And they went to the prison. I'll tell you something interesting. One of the members who didn't live in the house, Chuck Way. Years later, 40 years later, 30 years later, this is in 1971, 35 years later, this same man who stayed in Mississippi became the mayor of Jackson. He was a former member of Republican Radical. We had this major gun battle with the police. He became the mayor of Jackson. I think his son is the mayor now. Isn't that interesting? He became the mayor of Jackson. You see? You know, it's like Malcolm. I had a hate in Malcolm, I hated Mama Lee. I hated him. Now they got Malcolm on poster, poster stamp. Mama Lee on post stamp. Streets named after Malcolm. They co-opted Malcolm, co-opted Muhammad Ali. They were well loved now. Yeah. So this man became the mayor. I didn't know him that well. I knew uh, Ofago really well. He's a good friend of mine. So, but anyway, the, this is the legacy. This all this legacy seeking social justice goes back to the, this man we talked about earlier, Elton Blight. We said he brought Islam over here to, to addressing the social issues that he found in America and you Islam as the answer for these social issues. That is a legacy. That's the legacy. You see? That drove us to the point where we are now. Yeah. So I'm here just to invite you to be part of this legacy. I am now part of you know, the Imam America who Dallas Master of Islam. I've been Imam in Dallas for 20 years, preaching Da'i in Dallas for 20 years. I'm with this group called the Muslim Alliance with Black Lives. Think about that. Jewish people always had alliances with black people. They have gained traction that way in this country. Who you think helped start the NAACP? Jewish people. I was watching uh, Anderson Cooper a few weeks ago. No, it wasn't Anderson Cooper, this other guy on CNN. Coleman? Coleman? No, it was this black guy. Can't think of his name. What's his name? Uh, Lemon? Don Lemon? Yeah, Don Lemon. 
He had these, this Jewish guy and this black guy on there, and they're talking about their alliances, the alliance of Jews and black people in America. They need to strengthen the alliance and further the alliance. They've always had alliances. They're getting traction that way. So when we talk about Muslim alliance, we, if you want to gain traction in this country, have alliances with those people who are, who always have been oppressed <laughs> and oppressed and belittled and done wrong in this country, who have suffered in this country. Have alliances with those people. Yeah. That's what they've done, they gain traction. That is a legacy from Ali, Imam Wazbi Muhammad, Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad, Marcus Garvey, Ducey Muhammad, Ducey Muhammad opened up another, after, after, I did mention this, after uh, Marcus Garvey got deported, Ducey Muhammad, his mentor and friend, opened a mosque in Detroit in 1837. Universal Islam Association. The group he left was Universal uh, Negro Improvement Association. Name similar. But the driving force behind all these groups, this legacy in America, has been to seek social justice. That's what we should be involved in. Not be insular. Quran talks about believe he said, Ya Maruna Ben Maru, Yahana Aini Mukha, Yikuna Salat with Hatuna Zakat, Yati Allah Rasul Rasul Hua. They, Quran, they enjoin good. Ya Maruna Ben Maru, Yahana Aini Mukha. They enjoin good. They forbid either. Then Yikuna Salat with Hatuna Zakat, Yati Allah Rasul Rasul Hua. Then, you see the, the, the sequence there? They enjoy good. They forbid it. Then you can not salat with tuna zakat. Then they establish prayer and they pay zakat. You do the law Rasul who They believe in Allah and his messenger. There's a, that sequence is there for a reason. What we, we, we want to do? We want to skip over the first two things and get to the last. Establish prayer. And what you got? We all want prayer. Establish the kind. No, but first it said they establish, they they do good, they enjoy good, and they forbid evil. That's first. Come to kind umuti uku jatli na tamrun be meru tahana ene muka tuk manuna be la. You're the best community, not all Muslims, because he gives a qualifier here. Those who enjoy good and forbid evil. Then took me not took me not be lie. Didn't believe in God. We can't skip those uh, those first two things. The sequence, those things are first. Not just establishing prayer. You become insular then. You become irrelevant in society then. You think there's youth that done that? No. They got hospitals, they have, and lices and clinics and all kinds of things engaging in the community. I don't fault them for that. I'm not a hater. We believe in the brotherhood of everybody. I'm not, I'm not into that. I work with all races, all people, and you know, in a faith group. I don't have a problem with that. But we can't just be insular. So this group, I'm part of Muslim Lives, Black Lives. What we want to do is in the heart of the impoverished area. Have Muslim faith there and provide resources. Have, have high profile in those areas. When they're going door to door, Muhammad speaks, they gave them high profile. The social context of the day is not the same as it was then. We can still have boots on the ground now. But we're not even going door to door. We're not going to do what our nations want to do, but we have to have. We have to be engaged. We cannot be insular. To so my group, it's, it was initiated by uh, Emil Khalid Griggs, good friend of mine, African American brother in North Carolina, but he's always worked with ITNA. So this is an ITNA initiative under Emil Khalid Griggs. And he invited me to be part of this. So I'm part of this. Yeah. 
So we're trying to establish this in cities across America. We have these resource centers in the heart of the hood, <laughs> these depressed areas. See? The face of this law. Offering services in the name of Allah, in the name of Islam. See? In material for Islam, in classes, but same time, right? Food pantry, uh, resource center, uh, educational tutoring, and all the whole nine yards. See? Then we can have our masters too. You see? So alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you allowed me to come back. <laughs> Well, inshallah, we will. So I'm going to conclude with that. So thank you so much. I'm so honored and privileged to be with you again for two nights this weekend. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, let's do Q&A. We did Q&A the other night. We had a very interesting uh, exchange the other night. So. Our time now, so if okay. you can just ask, I'll ask one question. Okay. Wasn't there a movement at some point where there was a demand that he was, like, we talked about reparations, so they wanted, like, half of the United States or some part of the United States? <laughs> you know, that's a good point. I didn't tell the full story about Republic of Africa. We were trying to do what the Confederates could not do. They were trying to secede, right? We tried to do the same thing. We're going to take five southern states with a few rifles. We're going to take these things. We want to do a plebiscite. Our logic was this, that Africans brought over here would never ask whether they want to be citizens. So we wanted to do a plebiscite and take that to the UN. One of the things Malcolm was trying to do is connect our plight in America to the UN. Malcolm said this. He said, civil rights? He said, that's not our issue. Our problem stems from human rights. This is a UN issue. He said, so we wanted to take the, the UN. We wanted to do a plebiscite to the UN. We want part of the South as a republic of New Africa, a new republic Is of that New Africa. Of Nation of Islam initiative? No, 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 no. Like I said, these guys, uh, Mario Delhi was associated with Malcolm, Mal after Malcolm left the, the Nation of Islam. What was his name? Uh, Imari Obadeli. Imari Obadeli. He had a a Nigerian name, Obadeli. And wasn't there also another movement of going back to Africa? Oh, yeah, there's been several movements like that, going back to Africa. Marcus Garvey's Pan-Africanism, it wasn't necessarily going back to Africa, but it was connecting Africans in the diaspora, you know. You know, yeah. So we can, if we can entertain a few more questions. How uh, this In the wrong light was introduced, but people know maybe the previous generation. Right. And very rightly that uh, Islam just doesn't talk about one or two things, but social justice <coughs> was very important. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that was that's how it was very well received in the society because it was solving social justice problems and not just prayer and zakat. Right. Zakat and prayer goes hand in hand. Right. Them. Exactly. So exactly. another question is. There's some work done, the Malcolm X thing. Now this organization is there. I, it seems to me there's a huge opportunity. A huge work. There's a huge opportunity there. Opportunity, yes. To obviously work for social justice, which is part, which should be part of Muslim personality, plus get introduced more and more into the black community mm -hmm. as the sort of true face of Islam, that this is what Islam is. And there was some work done. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how much Malcolm was spent when he became Sunni Muslim, how much following he created at that time because then he was assassinated and all that. I don't know how much time he got, but I don't know how much Islam still resonates today with black populations generally. Well, most of us have relatives that, uh, you know, like I, I had a lot, I mentioned this other night, I have a lot of relatives that did become Muslim. I think my father gave a shahab, my sister gave a shahab, her son my brother, his wife. My other relatives are very poor as well. You see? So it's 
So Islam has been introduced to the black community. They are familiar with Muslims and so forth. They got cousins that are Muslim or neighbors that are Muslim. You know, so in the black community, Islam is not new. Right? But you bring up a very good point. This is not just the legacy of African American Muslims in America. This is the Prophet Islam legacy as well. You know, this is from the Quran. Enjoining good for dead and evil. This is straight from the Quran. You know, so we are also almost like a command. In the law, your mortal, the other one is son. Allah commands doing the justice and good. I mean, it's a command to enjoin good for dead and evil. But this is a new initiative. It's a new initiative. We are still organizing this. You know, so we're still organizing this. Nation of Islam could do it, you know, with some, you know, it's not so preordinated message of uh, this. It's like a religious organization. Right, right. So it's right. the same social issue with a true message. The difference is this. Nation of Islam, there was commitment. Commitment. They were serious. Serious. They was committed. I don't know how serious we are, how committed we are. I, I, was, I was taking rent money. My wife would take, I was taking rent money to buy my mother's big newspaper. Mm-hmm. I had to sell papers. I'm getting out there. Okay. So we, we were serious, it was a serious commitment we had. You can't ask, you know, most of them nowadays, I don't know how serious we are. But, uh, this alliance, you know, we're trying to create that alliance and to address, you know, some social issues in the name of Islam. That's the legacy. That's the Quran as well. Going through Malcolm, Elijah, Muhammad, it will blight. That is the legacy. So this is going to take some time. You know. So the, the imam has my number and we can, we can talk some more. Thank you so much. Inshallah, with that, we will conclude the program. I think there are some snacks outside. Just enjoy that, inshallah, and then we'll convene for Isha at 8.15. Jazakallah, Imam Khalid, once again. Assalamu alaikum. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika, nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.